Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation entitled Understanding Maxwell's Equations. This is a very relevant topic. I think that any electrical engineer should understand very well the Maxwell's Equations because they can help a lot in understanding things related to electrical engineering, electrical circuits, power electronics, and so on. So in this video we are going to try to explain clearly the Maxwell's equations by showing not only the equations themselves but also some examples of applications in real life. More specifically in components that we can find in our power converters and in our electrical circuits. So in this video we will see first the introduction, then we will present the different Maxwell's equations and each equation will be illustrated with one or more examples of applications. This presentation has been inspired by reading this book, the Feynman Lectures on Physics, volumes 1 and 2, where you can find more information about these topics. So in this small slide we can find all the equations of classical physics as we can find them in this reference, the book by Richard Feynman. So here we have the famous four Maxwell's equations. We have to try to remember these equations. If you pay attention it's not so difficult. We have the electrical field we have the magnetic field and we have two equations for the divergence of the electrical field and the magnetic field. And then we have two other equations for the curl of the electrical field and the magnetic field. So this is the first idea. Two equations provide the divergence of the fields and the other two equations provide the curl of the fields. To have the complete knowledge about electromagnetic fields, we need at least other two equations. One is the conservation of the charge, which is expressed as shown here, and the other one is the Lorentz force, which is shown here. Then we have the law of motion, the derivative of the momentum in time is equal to the force with the Einstein correction as shown here and finally we have the gravitation law and with this we have all the equations of classical physics. So let's start by the first law. The first law says that the divergence of the electric field is equal to the volumetric charge density divided by the permittivity of free space. This is the differential way of expressing the first law. This is a very compact way of expressing the first law, but it is not easy to understand the meaning of this law in the differential way, so usually it is better to go to the integral way of expressing the Maxwell equations, which is much easier to understand. If we use the divergence theorem, also known as Gauss theorem, we can say that the flux of the electric field through a closed surface is equal to the volumetric integral of the divergence over the whole volume inside the closed surface. So we get this expression here and this integral at the end is the total charge that we have inside the volume. So at the end we get this, Q sub T is the total charge inside the volume divided by the permittivity of free space. At the end the permittivity of free space is just a constant to adapt the units of the electric flux and the total charge. So as we are showing here, if we have a closed surface, we have an electric field, 
then we can say that the flux of the electric field through this closed surface is equal to the charge inside the volume, the charges that we can have inside the total charge inside the volume divided by the permittivity of free space. If in a given region of the space we have no charge, then we can say that the flux through any closed surface is going to be equal to zero. So it is also interesting to note that if we have charges outside the volume, they are not going to affect the flux through the closed surface. They can affect the distribution of the electric field, but the flux through the closed surface depends only on the charge inside the volume. Let's see an application of this first law. If we have a capacitor, as we are showing here, which is built with two plates, we have the top plate, we have the bottom plate, we are applying a voltage between the plates, then we have that the top plate on its surface is going to have a negative charge and the bottom plate is going to have a positive charge. And if the plates are very close, we know that the field, the electric field that we are going to have between the plates is very uniform. So we can calculate the magnitude of this field by using the first law of the Maxwell's equations. If we take a surface like this one in blue, it's a box surrounding the bottom plate, then we can calculate both parts of the Maxwell's equation. The flux through this surface is going to be only the flux on the top part of the surface, which is equal to the area of the plates. So we can say that the flux is going to be E times A. And the total charge inside the volume is equal to the total charge that we have on the bottom plate. So we have that the total charge is Q and the complete integral is Q divided by epsilon sub zero. So by equaling these two, we can get the intensity of the electric field inside the capacitor. Now, we also know that the voltage between the plates is equal to the intensity times the distance. Why is this? This is because the voltage is the work that we need to do against the electric field to move the unit of charge from one point to another. So if we want to move a unit of charge from the bottom plate to the top plate against the field, the work is the force times the distance. And the force per unit charge is the electric field intensity. So the voltage is equal to the electric field intensity times the distance between plates. And from these two equations, we finally get that the total charge is going to be proportional to the voltage applied between the plates. As we know, this factor here is known as capacitance of the capacitor and is given by this expression is the permittivity of free space times the area of the plates and divided by the distance between the plates. Also, we know that the intensity is the derivative of the charge with respect to time. So using this expression here, we can get that the current through a capacitor is the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage with respect to the time. Note that we usually talk about the current through the capacitor, but in reality, there is no movement of charges between the plates. The current is given just by the redistribution of the charges from one plate to the other through the wires that we have in the circuit. So this is the explanation of the behavior of a capacitor using the Maxwell's equations. So the second equation is even simpler. It says that the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero. 
So if we use the divergence theorem, again, we can say that the flux of the magnetic field through a closed surface has to be equal to the integral of the divergence over the volume inside the surface. And because the divergence is equal to zero, we can say that the flux through any closed surface of the magnetic field is always equal to zero. This means that there are no known sources of the magnetic field. Contrary to the case of the electric field, in which the electric field is generated by the charges, in the case of the magnetic field, we don't have any source that generates this field. An example of application of this second law is as shown here. Imagine that we have an inductor, we have a winding on a core, and the core has an air gap. We have a current circulating through the winding and creating a magnetic field. So using the second law, we can demonstrate that the magnetic field inside the core is equal to the magnetic field in the air gap. For this, if we do a zoom, on this area surrounding the air gap, we can take a closed surface, as shown here, cylindrical closed surface with the top part on the core and the bottom part on the air gap. So the net flux that we are going to have through this surface is going to be equal to the magnetic field in the air gap times the area A minus the magnetic field in the core times the area A. And this has to be equal to zero. So with this, we get that the magnetic field in the air gap is equal to the magnetic field in the core. In fact, it can be demonstrated in a similar way that when the magnetic field goes from one medium to the other, as shown here from the core to the air, the normal component of the magnetic field doesn't change. And because here the field is normal, the magnetic field is the same in the core and in the air gap. Now let's see the third law. This law says that the kernel of the electric field is equal to minus the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to the time. So again, this is a differential way to see this law. This is very compact and very easy to remember, but it is more understandable if we use now the Stokes theorem. The Stokes theorem says that the line integral of a field, for example here the field E, around a closed line, as shown here, for example, the line C is a loop, is a closed line. So the line integral of E around this loop has to be equal to the flux of the curl of the field through any surface that is bounded by the line C. So because the curl of E is equal to minus the derivative of B with respect to time, the line integral has to be equal to the flux of the derivative of B with respect to time through the surface S. But we can take the derivative in time out of the integral and we can express it in this way. So finally, we have that the law, the third law, says that the line integral of E around a loop is equal to minus the derivative with respect to time of the flux of B through the loop, which is the flux through any surface that is bounded by the line C. Let's see an application of the third law to the case of a capacitor. Here we have the two plates of the capacitor. We have a battery. We have two wires connecting the battery with the plates. And we are going to apply the third law by choosing a closed line C as shown here. It goes from the positive terminal of the battery inside the wire to one plate then crosses the space between the two plates, goes through the other wire, inside the other wire, until the negative terminal of the battery, and finally 
through the battery to the positive terminal again. So we are assuming that we are in an isolated region of the space, so we don't have any magnetic field. So we assume that the magnetic field is equal to zero, and therefore the line integral of the electric field around this line has to be equal to zero. So let's see the different components of this line integral. From one to two, we have that this integral is equal to zero because inside a good conductor, the electric field is negligible. So it's approximately equal to zero. From two to three, we have the electric field inside the capacitor between both plates. So because we are going from two to three, we are going in contrary direction of the magnetic field. And this integral will be equal to minus E times the distance between plates. And now we go from 3 to 4. So it's again inside the cable. E is equal to 0 inside a good conductor. So this integral is equal to 0 again. And finally, we have the integral going from 4 to 1. And we can calculate this integral because we know that the difference in voltage between 1 and 4 is equal to the battery voltage. And we know that the voltage is the work that we have to do to take the unity of charge from one point to the other. And therefore, this integral here, if there is no magnetic field, corresponds to this work and therefore corresponds to the voltage between these two points. So finally, by making the addition of all these integrals equal to zero, we get that the electric field inside the capacitor is equal to the voltage applied to the plates divided by the distance between the plates. We have used this expression before in an example with a capacitor, but this is the actual way to demonstrate that the electric field inside the capacitor has this value. Because in the previous slide we just said that the voltage between the plates is equal to the voltage across the battery. But in reality this is so because the line integral of the electric field inside the wires is equal to zero. This is another example of application of the third law. Here in this case we have an inductor, an air inductor with several terms and we are connecting the inductor to the battery using wires. So we can apply again the third law. We select this contour, this line from the terminal 1 of the battery through the wire inside the wire and going to the other terminal of the battery and Finally, from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery inside the, the battery. So in this case, we do have a magnetic field that we have to consider. So we need to calculate both sides of the law. If we do the line integral, we will get the following value from 1 to 0.2 is always inside the wire and we know that inside the wire the electric field is negligible so this integral is equal to zero and from point two to point one we have that the integral is equal to the battery voltage so finally we get this value vi for the line integral around c and now we calculate the flux of the magnetic field going through a surface that is bounded by the contour. So the exact representation of this surface is as shown here in this drawing, which is difficult to draw. But if the different terms are closed together, then we can say that the surface is approximately equal to the number of terms 
times the area A of each term. And we know that in an inductor, a solenoid, the magnetic field is almost constant inside the inductor. So we can say that the flux is going to be the number of terms times the magnetic field times the area. The magnetic field times the area, we usually represent this by phi, which is the flux given by a single term. So by substituting these values in the equation, we finally get that the voltage applied to the inductor is the number of terms times the derivative of 5 with respect to time. Or we can say, as we know, that the flux is proportional to the current. The proportionality constant is the inductance of the inductor, and therefore we get to the well-known equation of the inductor. The voltage is equal to the inductance times the derivative of the current with respect to time. So again, thanks to the fact that the electric field inside the wires is negligible, we can analyze the component as a lamp component and we can relate the voltage across the inductor with the current through the inductor using this very simple expression. So finally, we get to the fourth law of the Maxwell's equations. This is a little bit more complicated, but again, this one gives information about the curl of the magnetic field. So it says that the curl of the magnetic field is 1 over c squared times epsilon sub zero. This is a constant. C is the speed of light. So is this constant times the current density plus 1 over c squared times the derivative of the electric field with respect to time. Also, this factor here is equal to mu sub zero, so we can represent also this as mu sub zero, which is known as the permeability of free space. So, if we want to understand better this equation, we again use the Stokes theorem. So, we can say that the line integral of B around a closed contour as shown here, we have this closed line. So this line integral has to be equal to the flux of the curl of B through any surface S, as shown here, that is bounded by the closed line. And because the curl of B is equal to this value, then we have that the line integral is equal to the flux of the current density through the surface times this factor, plus the derivative in time of the flux of the electric field times this factor 1 over the speed of light squared. Now we can even simplify a little more this expression because usually in many applications we know this value here because this is equivalent to the current that is going through the surface. And in many applications, we know the currents that are going into or out from the surface. So this factor here is equal to this value, this constant, times the net current going through the surface S. And then we have this other factor. So at the end, the fourth law states the following. The line integral of B around a loop is equal to... 1 over c squared times epsilon sub zero times the net current through the loop plus 1 over c squared times the derivative in time of the flux of E through the loop. So this is the flux through any surface that is bounded by the loop. So it is also interesting to note these two factors here. We have this one that is mu sub zero. Mu sub zero is a small value, is 4 pi 10 to the minus 7 Henry per meter. But this factor here is even smaller. This is 1 over c squared. So this is very, very small. So usually in most of low frequency applications, this factor here is going to be negligible. Only if we work at very high frequencies, probably hundreds of megahertz of gigahertz, then we are going to have 
this factor making some kind of contribution to our application. So many times in low frequency applications, this component here of the fourth law can be neglected. Let's see now an application of the fourth law. Again, for the case of an inductor with the fourth law, we are going to be able to calculate the magnetic field that we have inside the inductor. So here we have the law. We have to calculate the different components. In this case, we are going to select a contour, a closed line, as shown here in green. This is C, the closed contour that we are selecting. We know that outside the solenoid, the magnetic field is approximately equal to zero, so the value of the line integral is only the value of the magnetic field times this side here of the contour, which is equal to the length of our inductor. So this is the value for this component. Now we have to calculate the flux of the other elements through a surface. We select this surface here that is bounded by the contour C. So the flux of the current, as we have seen, is the net current that is going through the surface. And here we have that each turn goes through the surface once. So this component here is going to be equal to mu sub zero times the number of terms times the current that is circulating through the inductor. And finally, the last component, as we have said, this value here is very, very small. It's something like 1 over 3 times 10 to minus 16. So usually at low frequencies, considering low frequencies below maybe 100 of megahertz, this is going to be negligible. So finally, by equaling these two values, we get the magnetic field inside the inductor. Now we can do some other calculations as we usually do in power electronics inductors. The flux through a turn is the magnetic field times the area. So we can get the flux from this expression by substituting the value of B. And curiously enough, we can get an expression like this one. The, the flux phi is the magnetomotive force, the number of turns times the current, divided by a factor that we can call the reluctance of our inductor. Even though this is an air inductor, we can do like this. So the reluctance is given by this expression. is the usual expression that we have for a reluctance, the length of our inductor, of our solenoid, divided by mu sub zero, because this is an air inductor, times the area, the area here of each term. And with this, we can also calculate the value of the inductance using the well-known expression, which is the number of terms squared divided by the reluctance. And I think that this is a very easy way of remembering how to calculate approximately the value of the inductance of an air inductor. But let's analyze how good is this expression to calculate the magnetic field and the inductance of an air inductor. In this video, thing number one, we saw how to model using finite elements an air core inductor. And for this, we have this inductor here with these dimensions and this number of turns, diameter, and so on. And we used these other equations here, which are more sophisticated equations to calculate the magnetic field inside the inductor and the inductance of the inductor. And we obtained these values. If we use the equations that we have seen in previous slides, which are these ones here, we can substitute and get approximately the same value for the magnetic field inside the inductor. And also the value of the inductance is very similar to the previous one. So these equations are quite good as long as the inductor is slender. So the diameter of the inductor is small compared with the length of the inductor. These expressions are good 
and very simple to remember in order to calculate both the magnetic field and the inductance of an um, air inductor. Well, with this we get to the end of this presentation. I hope that you find this video useful. Thank you very much for watching. Please let me know through the comments section of the video if you have any comment or question. And I hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye now.